<laughs> Hello. Get rid of some of those things. Good evening. Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good whatever part of the world you're in. Happy days. And lovely to be here. Hang on a second. Now yeah, that'll do. We'll leave it like that. So, hello, hello. Um, it is Sunday, 7.01 p.m. now, my time, here in semi-sunny California. It's a nice day today. And you are wherever you may happen to be, and that is a good place. So, no complaints, no worries there. Um, I am rumpled and rumbled and whatnot. Oy. Just looking at my shirt here. Looks like it just came out of the dryer and then sat there for a while. Um, <laughs> while I try to <laughs> forget it. Um, anyway, while I do this, let me make sure everything else is working. Yeah, it looks like it so far. Um, and uh, so I will check in at, in a, before too very long and say hello to all the people who have checked in on the comments list. And... Um, in the interim, what is there to say? Not much. We are, we've got uh, this week and one week left in January. So I am still doing all the things I've been telling you that I've been doing in terms of working on the new books. And the household is in good condition. Um, every, uh, you know, I mean, under the circumstances, we've got our backyard torn up. Um, because we're having to do stuff to our septic system and uh, we've got one of our bathrooms blocked off. <laughs> one of the young people put like black electrical tape across the door to, because we've got to have um, uh, that bathroom remodeled. And But, you know, I mean, that's just normal, albeit expensive stuff. Um, but otherwise, we're doing fine. Everybody is well. Everybody is boosted. The dogs are relatively happy. Um, the cat is relatively happy. The snake, as far as I know, is happy, although I haven't seen her lately, so I cannot attest to that firsthand. But I'm sure that I would be informed if we had any snake emergencies. So, let me see, what else? Anything? No, we're in the, that doldrums time of the year between the holidays and, you know, the, the springtime. Um, I remember being in retail, which I did a lot of in my early years because I decided I didn't want to go to college, at least not immediately. So um, I worked a lot of retail jobs. And uh, I, I remember well how dead this time of the year was. And, of course, after Christmas season, it was... You know, when everything was being done by hand and everybody who was shopping was shopping in person, uh, unless they had the Sears catalog, I guess. Um, you know, it was a kind of a rest and a, uh, therefore a bit of a respite and welcome. But it was still boring after the first couple of weeks. And um, I'm afraid that I am going to be like, you know, the, uh, the local shopping mall when there were still a lot of those kinds of things. And, and the local shopping mall in late January, not much going on. <clears throat> but as far as I'm concerned, that's a good thing because as you always hear me say, all I really do most of the time anyway is, is work. So more time to get my work done, fewer distractions. Um, so let me see, anything else? No, not really. I, I keep hoping that there'd be something interesting that I could report to you guys. But uh, I've just been, you know, hanging out, working, watching sports. A lot of sports going on at the moment, but I won't bore people with that. You're either into it or you're not. And uh, like a lot of my interests, nobody needs to get dragged through the whole thing. Um, you don't need to hear about sports. You don't need to hear about 70s punk bands or progressive bands. You don't need to hear about comic books. Um, I, if I ever do things about that, I'll do it as a something separate from reading. But uh, so... Yeah, I guess I might as well go ahead and say hello to the folks who are here and um, and start reading because God knows it's a big book. We're about a third of the way through, I would say. Yeah, maybe even getting closer to halfway through. Yeah, well, somewhere in between the two. Let's say 36%. Nah, 
<laughs> um, so let me just check in and see who's here. Mr. Unangst he left his angst at home. Well, that's probably a good thing every now and then. Kelly, hello. Good evening to see good and good to see you. Good evening. Barban, yes, Boxing Tad. A little late for Boxing Day, but then again, since Boxing Day doesn't really have anything to do with fisticuffs, it would have been a very silly pun anyway. Claudia, hello, good evening to you. Tim, and good to see you. Um, cold where you are? Yeah, I'm sure parts of, uh, especially if you're here in the States, I can't remember, but parts of America are quite cold at the moment. Steve, hello, Steve, and good, I'm glad you're back. Kristen, hello. Krista, and greetings and hello to you too. Emily, a pleasure. And yeah, I know, Kristen's talking about the, the drought, but at least we've had some rain this year. We've, you know, I mean, we've had worse starts to a to a winter season than this. This is, this is at least we got some water. We actually had, you know, our, our arroyo outside of our house, we had water in it for a while, which only happens during serious rain because otherwise it's so dry in California the last few years that it just sucks the water down immediately on a, on a, a small rainfall. Uh, Ray, greetings to you. Robert, okay, there he's, <laughs> I was saying your, Robert's comment said even and I was trying to figure that one out. And then I went, maybe it's not finished. And then, oh yes, the next comment, evening Tad and good people. Yes, Robert, hi, <laughs> good evening to you too. Wouter, hello, just a quick wave. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Um, I, I wouldn't be up listening to me read either. So you are, you are excused. Um, let me see, who else? Paul, my old friend, Paul Kylie drops in to say, Niners. Yes, that was an extremely exciting game. I was just in a panic. So uh, we're talking about the uh, football, if, in case those of you out there who do not know or from other countries where football has a different meaning. We're talking about American football. And Paul is a former SF Bay Area resident um, and a very entertaining and talented guy, too. There, send me money, Kylie. Let me see who else we have here. And Ron. Hello, Ron. Good to see you. Yeah, we went, Ron says nice hoodie, which is a very kind thing to say. We went through a stretch here where for some some reason, my wife, who is a splendid human being, but sometimes um, trifle over, exu over exuberant, got me like three powder blue hoodies in a row, slightly different shades. <laughs> So I've, I'm well, well equipped in powder blue hoodies. You know, there's no doubt about that. If anybody ever says, you know, can't get in without a powder blue hoodie, I'm not, I can not only get in, I can take plus two. So I'm set. Oh yes. And I'm wearing these things cause I'm having miserable wrist day. Uh, this is not a holiday. Believe me, there is no such holiday as miserable wrist day. There's just me having <laughs> little wrist problems and looking at the huge heavy book I'm going to have to hold while I'm reading tonight. So anyway, uh, and let me see, anybody else show up? Tim? Oh, I didn't say hello to you, Tim. Hello, Tim. Good to see you. I don't think I did anyway. Well, if I didn't, now I have. And Alan, David, Clark. Good to see you. Good, good, good. All right. Um, Paul, absolutely. Paul says, would love to hear you opine on comics and comics, lions and OSB. Um, I absolutely will one of these days. This is when I'm going to do a, I, I will start doing a thing and then I will introduce you to some of the darker and more frightening parts of my past, in many of which Paul Kiley uh, makes at least a cameo appearance. So um, <laughs> maybe Paul will call us in and we will we will discuss some of the history of the, uh, what can I call it, of the artistic fringe of 70s and 80s Palo Alto and its environs. Um, I, I had a revelation the other day because we were all suburban kids. You know, we all grew up in Palo Alto or around Palo Alto, um, which is the Stanford University college town. And when we were growing up, Palo Alto was not... I mean, there were parts of Palo Alto where the people had money and it was not by any means a, a, a poor community. No, I mean, it was quite a, a nicely provided for suburban community, but it was not 
the kind of heart of Silicon Valley and, you know, modern venture capital and all that. And it certainly was nowhere near as wealthy as it then later became because, you know, now I hear all these things from friends who used to live there and go, oh, it's so flippin' expensive. And I remember in the 80s and 90s, as it started to change, everybody go like, it's full of yuppies. Um, and it was really more of a college town in those days. It was much more similar in some ways to like Berkeley or something like that, you know. Um, but anyway, the, the realization that I had um, when I, w you know, just a few years ago was that if we had grown up in a city, we would have all wound up, you know, in various people's, you know, rock and roll books or the, the history of this art thing or that art thing, because we had a lot of really creative people. But because we were out in the suburbs where there, you know, San Francisco was, was 45 whatever miles away. It was a place you went to to do things like a concert. You know, obviously I went to most of my concerts in San Francisco and secondarily in San Jose or Oakland. But um, because we were not in a city, we didn't have that same ferment and we didn't have all the attached media. And you look at places like New York and Los Angeles and stuff and, uh, you know, there people were drawn there to to do creative things together and develop these scenes and we really were living in a place where we had to make our own scenes and we literally did i mean we uh, my very good friend josh and his family um started a uh, a discotheque a no id no alcohol discotheque back in the 70s for um kids uh, to come to who you know so we could have a place for kids to come and hang out and listen to music and dance and do stuff like that. Um, there was another group of people who started a coffee house for young people. And, you know, so we, our band used to play there along with other bands and other groups of, you know, musical performers and stuff. But it was all super small because it was out in the suburbs. And um, as a result, there was never quite the, the critical mass necessary to become sort of known outside the Bay Area and a lot, I mean, known outside of the, the peninsula as we call that part of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and as a result, I think, you know, not that we didn't, many of us didn't wind up going on to do creative things, but we were forced to kind of find our own paths. We did not have, you know, people clustered around looking to make a scene, you know, in the, in the, in the sense of a creative scene. Um, we had to try and build our own scene from scratch. And, you know, you have about 10 years there, you know, from late teens into late twenties before responsibility takes over in every person's life, you know, and that's when a lot of these things happen. That's, you know, where bands go to CBGBs or the, the Sunset Strip or whatever, and they make their mark or they fall apart and everybody goes off to do other things. Um, we didn't have that. And as a result, you know, we had this kind of different career or different path that so many of us took. Um, and from as for, in my case, it became more and more a thing about like, what can I do on my own? Because there aren't, you know, there isn't that kind of constant 24 hour ferment that you get in a city. And so I would be doing projects or playing in a band or whatever with people. And then, um, you know, whatever would happen would kind of peter out a little bit and I'd get frustrated because I was always very ambitious and kind of pushy. Um, a lot of us worked at the radio station together. You know, that's where I know Paul from originally, I think. Um, but but, you know, because of that, I got more and more frustrated about having to wait for other people or, you know, just the, the, the thing. There wasn't an instant way to turn and go, OK, you and I will start a band then or, you know, you and I will put on um, our own play, you know, and we'll we'll find a bunch of people and we'll write the music or whatever. So um, as a result, I kind of got more and more into what can I do on my own where I don't have to worry about there being enough other people involved or that the people involved actually show up, um, you know, and, and it eventually led me into writing as I became something more and more that I could hold a job or several jobs at some point and then also do you know, my creative stuff on the side. And as a result, I was able to carry on doing creative stuff well into my 20s. And eventually one of them happened, and that happened to be writing, as I'm sure you guessed. 
But there was a lot of things I was quite happy doing. I was very happy being in a band. I was very happy doing theater. I was very happy doing radio. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's odd. It's, you know, they, they sometimes say geography is destiny, or if they don't, they should. And I think in a, in a certain case that was. I think, you know, otherwise, if I had moved to maybe San Francisco or some other city, I think things would have been different. I think if we had lived in a city, people like Paul and I and my friend Rick that I mentioned last uh, night because I was wearing a shirt he gave me. Rick is a super talented musician, you know, guitar player. He can play piano. He can play lots of instruments. He writes songs. He's, you know, super talented guy. Um, I think we would have more likely have stuck with the things that we were first doing, but everybody kind of had to find alternatives because, again, there wasn't that critical mass that you get in a city where everybody literally comes in at that age to, to do things together. Anyway, just a thought. Sorry, I got, it was seeing Paul's name there that, that got me thinking about that. Um, so, all right, I am going to go back to the book and, um, let me see if there's anybody here who showed up that needs to be said hello to. Paul, Melissa does. And yes, Paul, that was the My Oh My disco I was referring to. That was our club in downtown Palo Alto um, that I worked at um, and Josh's whole family worked at. And um, they actually did most of the, the building and everything because, of course, it, was a, it had been a um, car dealership. It was a car dealership that... Uh, little old car dealership in downtown Palo Alto that got turned into a disco. And that's uh, there are the my, oh my the club my, oh my stories themselves. I could spend a whole night telling. It was, uh, it was an interesting time in an interesting place. Anyway, so we are reading from Otherland, City of Golden Shadow, and where we are tonight is that Rini and Kabu have gone up into the suburbs outside of Durban to consult with one of Rini's old teachers in her virtual engineering student years, uh, Susan Van Bleek. And uh, because she's gotten to the point now where they received this glowing golden gem-like object um, while in virtual space. So it only exists in virtual space. It's not obviously a real thing, but it's, a, it's a something that has information. So they're going to Susan to see what uh, she can do to help them figure out what this is and what it might have to do with the disappearance of, or rather the, the comas that many children, including Rini's brother, have fallen into. So here we go. Susan sank back against the cushions of her wheelchair, her face troubled. I respect your privacy, Irene, but I don't like the sound of this much. How did you get involved in such a thing? She looked over at Kabu, as though he might be the cause. Rini shrugged. Let's, let's say that I believe they've got something important to me, and I want it back. Very well, I give up. I never had patience for Miss Marplish guessing games. Let's see what you've got. Follow me. She led Rini and Kabu down the hallway in her silent chair. What looked like an ordinary pair of French doors opened up to reveal a small freight elevator. Thank God, thank God I put this in for moving equipment, said the doctor. Squeeze in tight now. Since this heap nonsense, if only I'd had the stairs, I wouldn't have been able to get down here for months. If I'd only had the stairs, I wouldn't have been able to get down, get down here for months. Well, maybe I could have made Jeremiah carry me. There's a picture. The basement seemed to cover almost as much space as the house itself. A large part of it was taken up by the lab, which contained several rows of tables in typical laboratory array. Miss and confusion was how the doctor put it. I've got a clean standalone system already, and I've finished the antiviral work I was doing with it, she said. We might as well use that. You'd probably just as soon watch this on a monitor screen, wouldn't you? Rini nodded emphatically. Even with Dr. Van Bleek around to help, she wasn't going to put herself in a surround environment to explore whatever gift the Mr. J's folks had sent her. Nobody got to play that trick on her twice. Okay, then. Fire up your pad and let's go. 
Load these so I can run some diagnostics before we try to move it onto the new system. After, se after several minutes, the doctor dropped her squeezers onto her lap robe and made another of her childlike faces. I can't get into the damn thing. But you're right, it's very strange. Doesn't seem to make much sense as an anti-intrusion device. How are you punishing someone if you Trojan horse something onto their system too big to be activated? Ah, well, you might as well hook up. Rini connected her pad to the doctor's dedicated machine. Things started to happen very quickly. It's transferring itself the same way it downloaded onto my pad in the first place. But it's not sending a copy. The whole thing is moving. Susan frowned as she watched the diagnostics flutter through their various calculations. Rini almost felt sorry for all the doctor's specialist programs, as though they were living things, tiny little scientists wringing their hands and arguing with each other as they tried to classify a completely alien object. I know, Rini said. It doesn't make sense. She broke off, staring. The monitor screen was beginning to bl glow more brightly. The diagnostic level disappeared entirely, numbers and symbols and graphs vanishing as though burned away by fire. Something was forming on the screen. What in the hell is that? Susan sounded irritated, but there was an edge of real disquiet in her voice. It's... it's a city. Rini leaned forward. A slightly hysterical laugh was building inside her. It was like stealing secret microfilm in some old spy flick and discovering it contained holiday snaps. It's visual feed of some city. That's no place I've ever seen. Susan, too, was leaning forward, as was Kabu, standing behind her chair. The light from the monitor gilded their faces. Look, have you ever seen cars like that? It's some kind of science fiction clip. Some Netflix. No, it's real. Rini couldn't say exactly how she knew, but she knew. If it had been a still photograph, like Susan's cliff painting, it would have been hard to tell. But movement increased the level of information to the eye and the brain exponentially. Even the best effects people found moving objects harder to synthesize. Rini hadn't been in the VR business as long as Susan, but she had a good, as good an eye as anybody and better than most. Even in Mr. J's, with the top-of-the-line machinery they clearly had at their command, she had been able to spot subtle failures of coordination and naturalistic movement. But this city of golden towers, of rippling banners and elevated trains had no such flaws. I... Think I have seen this somewhere, said Kabu. It is like a dream. Susan picked up her squeezers and made a few gestures. It's just running on automatic. I can't find any information attached to it. She frowned. I'll just... The picture vanished. For a moment, the entire monitor went dark. Then the screen came back up in a blizzard of flickering pixels. What did you do? Rini had to look away. The juddering, sparkling light reminded her of the last unpleasant hour in the club. Nothing. The damn thing just turned itself off. Susan restarted the system, which came back up as if everything were normal. It's gone. Turned itself off? Gone. Gone. There's no trace of it at all. Ten minutes later, Susan dropped her squeezers again and rolled her chair back from the monitor. She had searched both her own computer and Rini's pad diligently, with no result. "'My eyes hurt,' she said. "'Do you want to go at it?' "'I can't think of anything you haven't done. "'How could it just disappear? "'Some kind of autophage. "'Played, then ate itself. "'Nothing left now. "'So all we had was some picture of a city?' Rini was depressed. We don't know why, and now we don't even have that. Ah, of course, I almost forgot. Susan pulled her chair back close to the screen. I was taking a display sample when the thing went kaplunk. Let's see what we got. 
She directed the machine's search. A few moments later, the screen resolved into a gauzy golden abstract. We got it! The doctor squinted. Cack! It was just losing resolution when I got the snapshot. My eyes aren't so good on close-up work, Irene. Can you see anything in it at all, or is it just random colored pixels? I... I think so. There is a tower, Kabu said slowly. There. Right. Then we we'll need to move it onto the main system. Since I took the sample myself, we'll assume it's inert and therefore safe. Although this whole thing has been strange enough to make me less than completely confident about anything. Ah, well. She had a quick talk with the household wiring. A few minutes later, they were again staring at the golden smear, now stretched yards wide across the laboratory wall screen. I have some image enhancement gear that might help, she said. Some of the preliminary stages can work through while we have lunch. Clean up the signal noise, rewind the de-resolution sequence as much as possible. Come along. Jeremiah's probably, probably having a fit. Kabu? Rini put her hand on his shoulder. The bushman seemed entranced by the wall screen image. Are you okay? This way, even distorted, so it still seems familiar to me. He stared at the shapeless swirls of amber, gold, and creamy yellow. I have seen this somewhere, but it is not a memory so much as a feeling. Rini shrugged. I don't know what to say. Let's go have lunch. Maybe it will come to you. He followed her almost reluctantly, stopping one last time in the elevator doorway to look back, his brow wrinkled in perplexity. Susan had been right. Jeremiah was more than a little offended when the doctor and her guests trooped in twenty minutes late for lunch. I did not poach the fish until I heard you coming, he said accusingly, but I cannot promise anything about the vegetables. In fact, the vegetables had survived very nicely, and the sea bass was tender and flaky. Rini could not remember when she had eaten such a nice meal, and she took pains to tell Daco so. His good humor slightly restored, the man nodded as he cleared the dishes. Dr. Van Bleek would rather have sandwiches every day, he said. An art dealer asked for paintings on black velvet. Susan laughed. I just never want to have to come upstairs and sit down when I'm working. The days when I don't work through lunch and sometimes dinner are the days I'm feeling my age. You don't want me to be old, do you, Jeremiah? The doctor is not old, he said. The doctor is stubborn and self-centered. He withdrew to the kitchen. Poor man, Susan shook her head. He came to work for us when my husband was still alive. We used to have parties then, people from the university, foreign visitors. It was a more fulfilling household to run, I'm sure. But he's right. He doesn't see me most days after breakfast, unless there's some correspondence I have to sign. He leaves bitter little notes about all the things he's done that I haven't noticed. They make me laugh, I'm afraid. Kabu had been watching Jeremiah with careful interest. He is like my mother's brother, I think. A proud man who could do more than he is asked to do. It is not good for the spirit. Susan pursed her lips. Rini thought the doctor might be offended. Perhaps you are right, she said at last. I have not set Jeremiah many challenges lately. I have rather drawn in on myself. But maybe that has been selfish of me. She turned to Rini. He came to us at a time when things were still very, very unsettled, of course. He had been very poorly educated. You do not know how lucky you are, Irene. The school system was already much better by the time you came along. But I think Jeremiah would have done well in any number of things, given the opportunity. He is an extremely quick learner and very thorough. The doctor looked down at her hands, at the silver spoon held in her gnarled fingers. I had hoped his generation would be the last to grow up damaged by what we did. 
Rini could not help thinking of her own father, floundering in an ocean invisible to everyone else, unable to find solid ground on which to stand. I... I think about what you said, Kabu. Susan put down her fork and briskly waped, wiped her hands. It is possible to get too set in one's ways. Anyway, let's go see what we can do with our mystery city. The imaging programs had restored the snapshot to something like a recognizable picture. The substance of the city was now visible as a garden of fuzzy vertical oblongs and triangles with impressionist smears representing the roads and elevated rails. Rini and the doctor began to correct small areas, adding detail from their own memory that augmented the general patterns imposed by the enhancement gear. Kabu proved particularly helpful. His visual memory was excellent. Where Rini and Susan might remember that there had been windows in the flat plane of a wall, Kabu could often tell them how many there had been and which had been illuminated. After more than an hour, a picture had taken shape that was recognizably the Golden City, which had burned on the screen for a few brief moments. It was less sharply defined, and there were areas in which the reconstruction was largely guesswork, but anyone who had seen such a place would recognize this as an image of it. So, now we start searching. Susan tilted her head to one side, although it's still not quite right somehow. It doesn't look real anymore, said Rini. It's l lost that alive quality. Uh, of course it has. It's a flat, unmoving, totally rebuilt version, but that was part of the effect of the original. It was like looking through a hole in the computer at the real city. I suppose you're right. Still, it's the strangest damn place I've ever seen. If it's real, it must be one of those prefab, fibramic monstrosities they string up overnight in the Indonesian archipelago, or somewhere like that. She rubbed at her knees. These damned sensors are starting to chafe my legs. I'm afraid I'm going to have to call it a day, my dear. But I'll start searching for a good match off the specialist nets. You're not back at work yet, are you? Then you might as well let me do it. I've got at least three contacts I could, contracts I could charge it off to. Uh, multinationals with million human hour data comb projects who'd never notice a little extra, extra connection time. And I've got a friend, well, an acquaintance, named Martine de Rubin, who's an absolute top flight researcher. I'll see if she has anything to offer. Maybe Martine will even pitch in a little free help, since it's for a good cause. She looked at Rini, that shrewd, searching gaze again. It is for a good cause, isn't it? This is something very important to you. Rini could only nod. Right then, on your way. I'll call you if I get any hits. Daco met them outside the elevator on the main floor. As if by magic, he had the car waiting at the front door. Rini hugged Dr. Van Bleek and pressed a kiss against her powdered cheek. Thank you. It's been wonderful to see you. Susan smiled. You didn't have to wait until you were being chased by VR terrorists to come visit me, you know. I know. Thank you so much. Kabu shook the doctor's hand. She held on to him for a few moments, her eyes bright. It's been a pleasure to meet you. I hope you will come again. I would like that very much. Good. It's settled. She rolled her chair onto the porch as they climbed into the car, then waved to them from the shadows of the porch as Daco swung around the long driveway and out onto the tree-lined road. You look very sad. Kabu had been staring at her for a long, uncomfortable time. Not sad, just... Frustrated. Every time I think I might be getting somewhere with this, I run into a brick wall. You should not say I, but we. His liquid brown eyes rebuked her, but Rini could not even find the strength to feel guilty. You've helped me a lot, Kabu. Of course you have. I am not speaking of me, but of you. 
you are not alone. Look, today we have spoken to that wise woman, your friend, and she will certainly help us. There is strength in companionship, in family. Kabu spread his hands. We are all of us small when set against the great powers against the thunder or the sandstorm. This is more than a sandstorm. Rainy fumbled reflexively for a cigarette and remembered she couldn't smoke on the bus. If I'm not completely crazy, this is bigger and stranger than anything I've ever heard of. But that is just the time when you must call on those who will help you. In my family, we say, I wish baboons were on this rock. Except that we call them the people who sit on their heels. Call who? The baboons. I was taught that all the creatures who live beneath the sun are people, like us, but different. It is not a familiar way to think among city folk, I know. But to my family, especially my father's family, all living things are people. The baboons are the people that sit on their heels. Surely you have seen them and know it is so. Rini nodded, a little ashamed that she had only seen baboons caged in the Durban Zoo. But why did you say you wished there were baboons on a rock? It means that it is a time of great necessity and we need help. Usually my people and the people who sit on their heels were not friends. In fact, long ago, the baboons committed a great crime against our grandfather Mantis. There was a great war between his people and theirs. Rini could not help smiling. He spoke of these mythical beings, monkeys and mantises, as casually as if they were fellow students at the poly. A war? Yes, it came of a long argument. Mantis was fearful that things would turn sour. So, he pre so to be prepared, he sent one of his sons to gather sticks to make arrows. The baboons saw this boy carefully, carefully choosing and gathering the wood and asked him what he was doing. Kabu shook his head. Young Mantis was foolishly innocent. He told them that his father was preparing to make war against the people who sat on their heels. The baboons were enraged and fearful. They became more and more agitated, arguing among themselves. Then at last they fell upon young Mantis and killed him. Then, made bold by their easy victory, they took his eye and played with it throwing it back and forth between them as though it were a ball, crying, I want it. Whose turn is it? Over and over again as they fought for it. Old Grandfather Mantis heard his son crying out to him in a dream. He took his bow and ran so fast to the place that even the few arrows he carried rattled like wind in a thorn bush. He fought the baboons, and though he was far outnumbered, he managed to take from them his son's eye, although he was badly wounded himself. He put it in his skin bag and fled. He took the eye to a place where water rose from the ground and reeds grew, and he put the eye in the water, telling it to grow once more. Many days he returned to find nothing had changed but still he did not stop. Then one day he heard splashing and found his child made whole again, swimming in the water. Kabu grinned, enjoying the happy moment. Then his expression sobered. That, that was the first battle in the war between the baboons and the mantis people. It was a long and terrible fight, and both sides suffered many losses before it ended. But I don't understand. If that's the story, why would you say you want baboons to help you? They sound terrible. Ah, but they were only that way because they were frightened, thinking that Grandfather Mantis intended to make war on them. 
But the real reason we asked the baboons to help is an old story of my father's family. I fear that I am talking too much, though. He looked at her from beneath his eyelashes, with, Rini thought, a certain sly humor. No, please, she said. Anything was preferable to dwelling on her own failures as the bleak gray city rolled past the windows. Tell me. It happened long ago, so long that I'm sure you would believe, believe it to be a myth. He gave her a look that was mockingly stern. I was told that the woman involved was my grandmother's grandmother's grandmother. In any case, a woman of my family, whose name was Nuka, became separ separated from her people. There had been a drought, and all the people had to go in different directions, all to search the, for the... There had been a drought, and all the people had to go in different directions, all to search the farthest sipping holes. She and her husband went one direction, he carrying their last water in an ostrich egg, she carrying their young child upon her hip. They walked far, but did not find water at the first or the second hole they tried. They moved on, but had to stop because of the darkness. Thirsty, and hungry as well, for during a drought, of course, game is hard to find. They lay down to sleep. Nuka cred cradled her child close, singing so that he might forget the pains in his stomach. She awoke. The slivered moon which inspired men of the early race to make the first bow was high overhead, but it gave little light. Her husband sat upright beside her, his eyes wide and frightened. A voice spoke from the darkness beyond the last smouldering coals of their fire. They could see nothing but two eyes gleaming like cold, distant fires. I see three of you, two large, one small, the voice said. Give me the small one for I am hungry, and I will let the other two go. Nuka held her child close. Who is that? she cried. Who is there? But the voice only repeated what it had said before. We will not do that, her husband cried, and if you come near to our fire, I will shoot you with a poisoned arrow, and your blood will turn sour in your veins, and you will die. Then I would be foolish to come to your fire, the voice said. But I am patient. You are far from your people, and you must sleep some time. The eyes winked out. Nuka and her husband were very frightened. I know who that is, she said. That is Hyena the worst of the old ones. He will follow us until we fall asleep. Then he will kill us and devour our child. Then I will fight him now before weariness and thirst take all my strength away, said her husband. But it may be my day to die, for Hyena is clever and his jaws are strong. I will go out to fight him, but you must run away with our child. Nuka argued with him, but he would not change his mind. He sang a song to the morning star, the greatest of all hunters, then went out into the darkness. Nuka wept as she carried their child away. She heard a coughing bark. Truth, truth, truth. Kabu jutted, jutted his chin. Oh, sorry. She heard a coughing bark. Chuf, chuf. Kabu ch jutted his chin forward to make the noise. And then her husband cried out. After that, she heard nothing. She ran and ran, urging her child to be silent. After a while, she heard a voice calling from behind her. I see two of you, one large and one small. Give me the small one, for I am hungry and I will let the other one go. 
She had a great fear then, for she knew that old hyena had killed her husband, and that soon he would catch her as well and kill both her and her child, and there were none of her people anywhere close that could help her. She was alone in that night. Kabu's voice had taken on a strange cadence, as though the original tale and its original words struggled to make itself heard through the unfamiliar English tongue. Rini, who had been wondering a little uncomfortably whether her friend actually believed the story was true, suddenly had a kind of revelation. It was a story, no more, no less. And stories were the things people used to give the universe a shape. In that, she realized, Kabu was exactly right. There was little difference between a folk tale a religious revelation, and a scientific theory. It was an unsettling and oddly liberating concept, and for a moment she lost the track of Kabu's tale. Rising before her from the sand three times her height, she climbed this stone, holding her child close against her breasts. She could hear hyenas breathing louder and louder, and when she looked back, she could see his great yellow eyes in the darkness, growing larger and larger. She sang again, Grandfather Mantis, help me now! Grandmother Star, help me now! Send me strength to climb! She climbed until she was out of Hyena's reach, and then huddled in a crack in the rock as he walked back and forth below. Soon you will be hungry. Soon you will be thirsty, Hyena called up to her. Soon your child will be hungry and thirsty too, and will cry for sweet milk and water. Soon the hot sun will rise. The rock is bare and nothing grows upon it. What will you do when your stomach begins to ache? when your tongue cracks like the mud cracks. Nuka felt a great fear then, for everything that old hyena said was true. She began to weep, crying, Here is where I have come to the ending. Here where no one is my friend and my family is far away. She heard old hyena singing to himself below, settled in to wait. Then a voice said to her, What are you doing here on a rock? A person came down from the top of the rock, and it was one of the people who sit on their heels. In old times, my family's people had been at war with the baboons, so Nuka was afraid. Do not hurt me, she said. Old hyena has driven me here. He has killed my husband, and he waits below to kill me and my child. This person looked at her, and when he spoke, he was angry. Why do you say this to us? Why do you ask us not to hurt you? Have we ever offered you harm? Nuka bowed her head. Your people and my people were enemies once. You fought our war with Grandfather Mantis, and I have never offered you friendship. Because you are not a friend does not make you an enemy, said the baboon. And hyena down below is an enemy to both of us. Come up to the top of the rock where the rest of my people are. Nuka climbed up behind him. When she got to the top of the rock, she saw that all the baboons were wearing headdresses of badger hair and ostrich plumes, for they were having a celebration feast. They gave food to her and her child, and when everyone was full, one of the oldest and wisest of the people who sit on their heels spoke to her, saying, Now we must talk together, thinking of what we may do about old hyena, for just as you are trapped upon this rock, so are we, and now we have eaten all the food and drunk all the water. They talked and talked for a long time, and the hyena down below became impatient 
and shouted up to them, I smell the people who sit on their heels, and them too I will bite and crack their bones in my jaws. Come down and give me the smallest, tenderest one, and I will let the rest of you go. The old baboon turned to Nuka and said, There is a red flame that your people can summon. Summon it now, for if you can, there may be something we can do. Nuka took out her fire starter and bent down low so the wind would not blow away the spark. And when she had made the red flames come, she and the baboons took a piece of stone from the great rock and put it in the fire. When it was hot, Nuka wrapped it in a piece of hide that the old baboon gave her. Then she went to the edge of the rock and called down to old hyena. I am going to throw you down, my child, because I am hungry and thirsty and the rock is bare. Good, throw him down, hyena said. I am hungry too. Nuka leaned out and threw down the hot stone. Old hyena leaped on it and swallowed it, hide and all. When it was inside his belly, it began to burn him and he called out to the clouds, begging them to send rain, but no rain came. He rolled on the ground, trying to make himself vomit it up again, but while he was doing this, Nuka and the baboons came down from the rock and picked up more stones and killed Hyena with them. Nuka thanked the people who sat on their heels, and the oldest of those people said to her, Remember that when the greater enemy was before us both, we were your friends. She swore that she would, and from that day, when danger or confusion is upon my family, we say, I wish baboons were on this rock. Rini left Kabu in the Pine Town bus station, with scarcely time to say goodbye since her local was about to pull out. As the bus rolled down the ramp into the busy rush hour street, she watched the small young man standing beneath the overhang, scanning the schedule board, and again felt a rush of guilt. He believes that baboons are going to come and help him. Jesus, mercy, what have I dragged him into? For that matter, what had she gotten herself into? She seemed to have made some very powerful enemies, and... For all that she had almost died, she had very little idea of what might be going on, and even less proof. Make that no proof. Well, a blurry snapshot of a city, one copy on my pad, one on Susan's system. Try that with UNCOM. Yes, we think these people are murdering the minds of children. Our evidence? This picture of a lot of tall buildings. There were quite a lot of people out on the streets around her neighborhood in the lowlands of Pinetown. She was a little surprised since it was a weeknight, but the people on the sidewalk definitely exhibited something of a carnival air, standing in knots in the center of the road, calling out to acquaintances, passing cans of beer around. When she dismounted the bus at the bottom of the hill, she could even smell smoke hanging sharp in the air, as though someone had been letting off fireworks. It was only when she had made her way halfway up Ubusika Street and saw the lights of emergency vehicles flaring and dying against the side of the flat block tower, the cloud of camera drones hovering like flies in front of the flames, that she finally understood. She was breathless and sweating when she reached the police cordon. A thick pall of smoke was funneling upward from the flat block roof, a dark finger against the evening sky. Several of the windows on her floor were smashed and blackened as if by intense heat exploding outward. Rini's stomach con contracted in terror when she saw that one of them was hers. She counted again, hoping that she had been wrong, but knowing she hadn't. A young black trooper in a visor held her back as she pressed against the temporary barrier, begging to be let through. 
When she told him she was a resident, he directed her to a mobile trailer at the far side of the parking lot. At least a hundred people from the flat block, and two or three times that number of people from the surrounding area, were milling in the street. <coughs> were milling in the street, but Rini didn't see her father among them. Suddenly, she was trying desperately to remember what he'd said he was going to do that day. Usually, he was home by late afternoon. There was too much of a crush around the trailer to talk to anyone official. Dozens of voices were paying for attention, were baying for attention, most desperate for news of loved ones, some just wanting to know what had happened or whether there would be insurance compensation. Rini was pushed and jostled until she thought she would scream from frustration and fear. When she realized that no one would notice if she did scream, she fought her way back out of the crowd. Her eyes blurred with tears. Misulaweo, Mr. Prakesh, the small round Asian man who lived down the hall, took his hand from her arm as if surprised at himself. He was wearing pajamas and a bathrobe, but had pulled a pair of unlaced takis onto his feet. This is terrible, is it not? Have you seen my father? He shook his head. No, I have not seen him. It is too confusing here. My wife. And daughter are somewhere here, but because they came out with me. But I have not seen them since. What happened? An explosion, I think. We were eating our meal, then boom! He clapped his hands together. Before we knew what had occurred, there were people in the hallway shouting. I do not know what has caused it. He shrugged nervously as though he might somehow be held responsible. Did you see the helicopters? Many of them came, dumping foam on the roof and spraying it on the outside walls. I am sure it will make us all very sick. Rini pulled away from him. She could not share in his alarmed but somehow excited mood. His family was safe, doubtless gossiping with other neighbors. Had everyone survived? Surely not, with damage of the sort she could see. Where was her father? She felt cold all over. So many times she had wanted him gone, wished him and his bad temper out of her life, but she had never thought it might come to this. 7.30 in the evening, the street full of chattering voyeurs and shell-shocked casualties. Things didn't happen this suddenly, did they? She stopped short, staring at the blackened row of windows. Could it have been her? Had something she'd done inspired a reprisal from the people at Mr. J's? Rini shook her head, feeling dizzy. Surely that was paranoia. An old heater, faulty wiring, someone using a cheap stove. There were any number of things that could cause this, and all of them far more likely than the murderous vengeance of the owners of a VR club. A murmur of thrilled horror went through the crowd. The firefighters were bringing stretchers out the front door. Rini was terrified, but could not simply wait for news. She tried to push back through the knot of onlookers, but passage was impossible. Squirming, applying an elbow when necessary, she worked her way out to the edge of the crowd, meaning to circle around and try to get near the front door from the other side of the cordon. He was sitting on a curb beside an unoccupied police van his head in his hands. Papa? Papa! She dropped to her knees and threw her arms around him. He looked up slowly, as though not sure what was happening. He smelled pungently of beer, but at the moment she didn't care. Rini! Girl, that you? He stared at her for a moment, his reddened eyes so intent that she thought he might hit her. Instead, he burst into tears and wrapped his arms around her shoulders, pushing his face against her neck, hugging her so close she was almost throttled. Oh, girl, I feel so bad. I shouldn't have done it. I thought you were inside there. Oh, God, Rini, I feel so bad. I'm so ashamed. Papa, what are you talking about? What did you do? You are out. You're going out for the day. See your teacher friend. He shook his head but would not meet her eyes. 
Walter, Walter, come by. He said, let's just go out and have a little time. But I drank too much. I came back. This whole place burned up here. And I thought you were back and got burned up too. He swallowed air, struggling. I am so ashamed. Oh, Papa, I'm okay. I just got back. I was worried about you. He took a deep, shuddering breath. I saw the fire burning that place up. Jesus, save me, girl. I thought about your poor mother. I thought I lost you too. Rini was crying now as well. It was a while until she could bear to let him go. They sat side by side on the curb, watching the last of the flames slowly wink out as the firefighters finished their job. Everything, said Long Joseph. All Stephen's toys, the wall screen, everything. I don't know what we gonna do, girl. Right now I think we need to go find some coffee. She stood up, then stretched out her hand. Her father took it and got to his feet, shaky and unstable. Coffee? He stared at what had been their home. The flat block looked like the site of a fierce battle that nobody had won. I guess so, he said. Why not? And that's where we're going to end, just a couple of minutes past the top of the hour, because that is the end of the chapter. So, with that, um, I'm going to wrap it up since we're already a little past the top of the hour. And go rest my wrist. Go rest my wrist. Did you get that? Did you see that? That's why I'm a pro. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for joining me. I will be back next Sunday, first at 1 a.m. for the non-American contingent. And then back at this slot, 7 p.m., for those of you for whom this is a better time. I um, want to thank Paul for dropping in tonight and reminding me of all kinds of strange things out of the past. Um, and I will see you all very soon. Take good care of yourselves. Take good care of your friends and loved ones. Take good care of those around you. Um, and then... It'll be worth taking care of yourself as well, so it all works out, if you see what I mean. Okay, thanks again. Lovely to have you.